hopefully you can see my screen there now, everybody. But um, and as Kevin said, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dave Lowry, the Head of Research Insights here at Frequin. Um, we've got an hour for today's session, so there's a fair bit to run through, but I'm hoping to leave a bit of uh, time at the end for some Q&A. So please do store up your questions either until the end or I can post them in the Q&A box as we're going through, but I'll do my best to answer them. Um, I can't promise that I'll be able to answer absolutely everything, but I'll certainly do my best. Um, apologies also to the Nelson River Head Code, so if you struggle to understand me, please just do follow up with any additional questions. Um, the plan for today's session is to provide a bit of a global overview of the private capital industry, so we can see the context of where we stand overall today. The plan then is to drill down to take a look at the major private capital asset classes before finishing with an overview of uh, ESG, which I'm sure you'll probably all agree is an important topic for, uh, for everybody at the moment. So firstly, for all of those of you who aren't familiar with Frequin, we're the leading provider of alternative assets data with global coverage across fundraising, performance, deals, and LP and GP activity. We've got several hundred research professionals working around the world collecting and collating data on the industry. And the data you see here today is a combination of their collective efforts and Prequin's innovative technical solutions, as well as its global reach. So to begin with, um, a global market overview. We'll start here with our 2025 um, AUM forecasts. And within these, we can see solid growth across all asset classes over the next five years or so with AUM growth set to accelerate from the levels experienced between 2010 and 2020. Interesting point here is that this is private capital AUM history, um, as, as well as our forecasts. We work in, in my team relatively closely with our data, internal data science team to put these models together. This is an update to our forecasts that were published towards the back end of last year. And we were deliberately conservative when we published those um, around last November time as part of our Future of Alternatives 2025 digital campaign. We used um, AUM at that point um, at uh, Q2 of 2020. So you can understand that that was a really conservative number to base our forecast on because we've had a very, very um, weak Q1 and that kind of fed through into Q2. We've been a little bit more, um, I wouldn't say aggressive, but we've, we've kind of baked in some stronger numbers for 2020, which I think is kind of a reasonable thing to do because although 2020 was um, a difficult year for many asset classes and for many managers and um, and uh, investors, it was actually a really, really strong year, actually, in, in, uh, in many regards. So AUM growth in the past, and we expect in the future, has been driven by strong fundraising markets, um, along with solid performance, and 2020 was actually no exception to that. It was actually the fourth consecutive year with private capital fundraising above a trillion dollars. Low rates are continuing to drive allocations to alternative markets, and managers across asset classes reaffirmed both their market knowledge and the strength of their relationships with portfolio companies last year. This also made their investors as comfortable as possible throughout what was a very difficult period. And we'd see this as a key strength for the industry overall. But growth in the future is unlikely to be even across asset classes or geographies. But having said that, private equity stands out to deliver the strongest growth, followed by private debt and infrastructure. We'll come on to the actual numbers shortly, but um, Asia is likely to see the strongest growth of any region. And investors are telling us in our surveys that they intend to allocate increasing amounts of capital to, to Asia particularly. There are often questions around whether rising amounts of capital can be deployed. And while there was some hit to deal activity last year, this wasn't consistent across all asset classes or geographies. If we turn now to look at the absolute growth across asset classes, we can see that PE, private equity, stands out above both infrastructure and private debt. Across regions, we're expecting solid growth across Asia, far outpacing all other regions. Europe's a bit likely to, to grow faster than the US, potentially a story of the market there catching up in terms of maturity. Also, when you look at the, uh, the returns available from European fixed income investments, with many government bonds still trading at uh, either, either at zero or still sometimes in negative territory, this is continuing to drive European allocations towards alternative investments. Growth in the diversified multi-regional fund is quite interesting as these funds don't have a, have a specific target geography and they generally have the most broad remix of the target strategies and sectors wherever they find them. When we look at the drivers of regional growth, our investors do tell us a, a relatively interesting story. So what we can see here, we asked a question of our investors to see which regions they thought presented the strongest opportunities in 2020 compared to 2025. If we look at the uh, 2020 outlook, 
North America stands head and shoulders above the rest, followed by Europe, relatively closely then by APEC. But these are all actually going to fit pretty much on their head when we look at 2025. We see a significant reduction in potential demand from North America and Europe, with a much greater focus on Asia Pacific, rest of the world, and the emerging markets overall. This is consistent with our AUM forecast, and it's a story that we believe is kind of telling us that investors are looking a bit more, um, more broad geographic regions in their search of returns. They're much more willing to take on uh, risk in emerging markets and also kind of faster growing markets, particularly when it comes to diversification of portfolios. To highlight the uh, continued attractiveness of alternative assets overall, I've already mentioned that, that we've had four years of uh, $1 trillion plus capital raising. But I wouldn't actually be surprised looking at where we are now um, before the end of May this year if we hit um, a fifth year of a, of a trillion dollars plus. One of the trends that's really clear to see here is that the number of funds closed peaked in 2017 and has actually been in decline ever since. This is kind of primarily down to the China effect or an APAC effect, whereas previously between 2015 and 2018, or 2017 particularly, there was a really big increase in the number of smaller funds targeting Chinese investments in particular. Geopolitical tensions with the US and a, and a bit of a clap down within China has impacted the number of funds coming to market there. But when you look at the overall global picture, we are actually kind of seeing a relatively solid growth and kind of relatively solid maintenance of the actual amount that's been raised across all of these funds. Excuse me. This points to funds becoming bigger and the kind of bigger managers taking a larger share of the market. We'll come on to this as we look at the individual asset classes in a bit more detail. So far, fundraising has held up remarkably well throughout 2021, and we're actually at an amount equal to 46% of last year's total capital raised already. And that's without the kind of cyclical effects or the kind of seasonal effects of Q4, which would expect a big bounce later in the year. But it's not all positive news. Inflation is among the most major concern for investors at present, and from this chart, it's easy to see why. There are feelings that any inflation increase should prove transitory, but this is something that will have, that will have to be managed very carefully by the Fed. In the conversations that we're having with our investors and managed clients around the world, it's clear that they're watching very, very closely what the Fed are doing. And I think that would also be fair to say for governments around the world as well, just, just to see what happens with the US experience. I'd be interested to hear in the Q&A session if you have any questions or any views that, that are worth kind of sharing around your views on, uh, on inflation expectations, whether you feel that um, overall trends are deflationary or whether you think that this is a threat to any specific parts of the market. Turning now to the private equity and venture capital space, when we look a bit more closely at private equity fundraising, and this also includes venture capital, more funds and capital are raised in Asia so far this year compared to Europe, which is a bit of a shift in trend that is entirely consistent with what our investors were telling us with their kind of pivot towards APAC. Thus far in 2021, fundraising in private equity has held up really well and had a solid recovery in, 24, uh, in Q4 of 2020. So far this year, you could almost ask what's been the effect of the pandemic when you look at Q1 of 2020 versus Q1 of 2021. The number of funds closed is on a par and the actual amount of capital raised that has increased. When we turn to buy out deal activity, you can see the real surge in the second half of 2020 as measured by aggregate deal um, values. You can really kind of see the blue line there particularly, which is the US or North America. This is a trend that's also continuing as we, enter, as we progress through 2021. So this chart, chart shows the rapid recovery in buy out deals within the US from Q3. And while there was solid growth in Europe, activity in, in the US has far outpaced the rest of the world, driving global growth. Debt still remains relatively uh, freely available, and the US government is continuing to add stimulus to the economy, supported by the Fed, as we've kind of previously mentioned. Within the US, IT and consumer discretionary deals are the dominant two sectors over the last six or eight months. This could possibly be a move by investors to get ahead of the consumer recovery curve and position themselves for future growth. Certainly among the investors we speak to, there's a real desire to be positioned on the right side of this future growth in, um, over the next year or so. It's likely that those managers who are best positioned are going to deliver the strongest performance, unsurprisingly. On the venture capital side now, this is really the bright spot of the market. 
highlighted here by surging aggregate deal values in North America. There are a larger number of, of, of themes at play here, both including higher valuations, which might be a spillover from public equity markets, but also a migration towards later stage deals. In recent months, there have been a number of successful IPOs of VC-backed firms soon after late stage capital raisings. And within these, we can include the likes of Snowflake and Palantir, for example. This has resulted in significant profits, even for those later stage investors. And this is really supporting activity at this part of the market. Looking now in a little bit more detail at secondaries, we can see here that secondaries are accounting for a rising share of the private equity market in recent years. This is unlikely to stop the trend, but the deal flow will be vital to the growth in this space in future. 2020 might not have panned out as expected, but the second half of 2021 and into 2022, there could be an increase in activity. And again, a lot remains to be seen as to the effects of um, the either the reduction or the kind of slowdown in stimulus being added to the economy. At what point will those firms that have been not so much artificially supported, but those that have been aided by government and the various support packages in place, um, when will they start to roll off and when will those kind of firms start to encounter some future distress? Still remains to be seen at the moment, to be honest with you. When we look at secondary fundraising and who might be active um, in the market there, it's a, it's a real case of feast and famine within secondaries, to be completely frank with you. What you can say now is that many funds are poised to take advantage of deals as and when they are launched. And while this is positive for pricing, it's likely to be less so for future returns. When we talk about support for the for secondaries um, fundraising, you can really see here that this is data as of the 19th of May. Fundraising in 2020 was obviously very, very strong. And there's been a huge amount of interest um, from emerging market-based LPs that are relatively new to the asset class. And they're really like the J-curve mitigation effect. From this chart, it's clear to see that secondary performance is um, uh, secondary funds, sorry, do outperform the all private equity um, benchmarks. It would also be fair to say that performance for later vintages is likely to drop off, but the longer-term outperformance story is real, and it's one of the things that's really attracting investors to this part of the market. The thing that we've been talking about for a while is the increasing prevalence of large managers seeking permanent or perpetual pools of capital. And this is something that we expect to accelerate over the next um, few months. We can see here that KKR, Apollo and Carlisle have all been active in either acquiring or partnering with insurance firms. This is potentially a really interesting strategy because it means that there's a broad pool of um, permanent capital to then go and draw upon almost reducing the need to for annual or kind of frequent fundraising rounds, and um, particularly. It means that it, rather than kind of looking at the usual fundraising cycle or the fund life cycle, um, a manager is able to keep this capital for a, um, I suppose, an, expen an, an extended period of time. So there's no need to keep recycling assets. They can kind of hold them for as long as they need to in order to drive the returns. I think this is going to be an interesting development. On the flip side, this is actually a reverse of what happens with many managers or investors when they've already partnered up with their insurance firms. So they can often be kind of keen to reduce their reliance on their, on their kind of parent insurance entity over time. So it's interesting to see this in reverse. We, we, we do feel that this is a trend that will be accelerating in the, in the future. Another part of the market where we've been speaking to, our, to, to both our investor and manager clients is uh, SPACs. Obviously, huge generators of uh, headlines and column inches uh, in the press around the world, not without reason. When we asked our um, investor clients particularly what their views were on SPACs towards the end of last year, the bulk of them didn't really view SPACs as a threat. Um, if anything, they were seen as a potentially interesting um, exit route, particularly for late stage VC investors. But since then, we've had the Q1 boom. And while the SEC has slowed down the frenzy, those, that did, the, those SPACs that did come to market have a significant pool of capital to draw upon. If we look at the $140 billion currently seeking acquisition, when we add leverage to that, it actually kind of makes SPACs a much more viable threat to, to buy out deal activity, realistically. Um, if we think of $560 billion of potential deal value there, that's equal to 69% PVC deal values throughout 2020. And these SPACs are doing some really high profile and you could argue very expensive or quite pricey transactions. 
If we look at Grab as an example of that there, $40 billion in valuation of 25 times revenue, it does beg the question of, is this the peak of the market when SPACs are willing to kind of pay significant sums to take these um, firms public, essentially? We don't have a very firm view as to the outlook for SPACs right now. I think we need a bit more clarity from the SEC and what their um, early stage ruling actually means over the long term. It could be that we have fewer SPACs in future, but the quality of those that listing actually increases quite significantly. But that still remains to be seen. We're a long way from seeing the, the, uh, the SPAC phenomenon play out just yet, I would say. Turning now to real estate, when we look at um, global real estate fundraising, you can still see the uh, pandemic effects. Um, they're quite noticeable during Q1 of this year. Prior to that, you could also say that late, late cycle effects kicked in prior to COVID. Still, we did see a steady increase in capital raised. This could have been a uh, FOMO effect or the kind of fear of missing out. Nobody knew when the real estate cycle would end and it had already lasted for many, many years up to the end of 2019. Well, nobody would have predicted the pandemic was the thing that would end the real estate cycle for some sectors, at least. 2021 could see a continuation of the weaker fundraising environment in the short term, at least. We can see the kind of potential spillover effects of that weaker fundraising environment throughout 2020 in the figures here. So this is looking at funds in market, which are at record levels. But to be honest with you, it's a theme we've been witnessing for several years now. When we look at drivers of the growth of the number of funds, between 2019 and 2020, there was a 44% increase in the number of funds and a 20% increase in the amount of capital that they were targeting. This points towards a larger number of smaller funds in market. That said, the largest funds have had little trouble in closing, often above initial targets, but generally spending a little bit longer on the road. This is likely a reflection of weaker fundraising market in 2020, spilling over into 2021 and a potential overhang of funds. With this backdrop, it would certainly be fair to say that competition for capital within real estate markets is incredibly fierce. So as a manager, what can you do to differentiate versus your rivals? Does, does this mean that there might be pressure on fees in the future as competition for, um, for investors' capital heats up? It also begs the question, are managers offering funds in market that investors are really looking for? While there was a big spike in the uh, number of distressed funds in market throughout the early stages of the pandemic, you could argue that the window for those distressed investments closed very, very quickly, primarily as a result of government and central bank action around the world. So we're, we're watching the, the composition of these funds and how, they, how that changes relatively closely as we progress throughout this year. Turning now to, to dry powder and the age of dry powder specifically, what we've got here is a look at the weighted average age of dry powder targeting the real estate asset class. And it's clear here that it's not been subject to huge amounts of variability in recent years, despite the amount of dry powder itself increasing quite significantly, particularly compared to 2012 and 2013, when the cycle was really kind of kicking in. This points to a steady deployment of capital as it's raised, and the ability of the real estate sector to absorb greater weights of capital over time. When we look at where this dry powder will be deployed, top sectors such as industrial are still performing well from an investor demand and a pricing perspective. We're seeing a big increase in the number of built to suit developments, which are providing an entry point for some managers, and portfolio deals are also proving particularly attractive, providing either meaningful scale for those entering the sector at what could be um, described as a relatively late time, or an ability for those who've been invested over the longer term to exit at scale and realise some pretty solid profits. Office markets, in contrast, are actually remaining relatively weak, with no significant rebound in deal activity during Q1 of this year. Uncertainty around occupied demand remains, and activities pointing towards more refurbishment than development, aiding value-added strategies particularly. And while this is a, a, a specific London data point, there was a, the, the uh, Deloitte London Crane survey was released um, in the last week or so, and that points towards a significant increase in the amount of office refurbishments, as many older offices that could potentially become obsolete much quicker are actually going to be subject to significant refurbishment to try and reposition those assets. So this is a positive potential investment story for value-added funds particularly. So when we look at the breakdown of the, uh, the funds, that account for this um, dry, dry powder, 
um, it's likely that that's potentially going to be drawn down relatively quickly for value added funds particularly. When we look at the overall um, fundraising picture, it's clear that capital consolidation is continuing. Funds outside of the top 50 largest so throughout 2020 accounted for just 25% of all capital raised. So this is really consistent with the whole theme and the story that we've been telling for some time, that funds are getting bigger and the bigger managers are benefiting. I think this isn't just a, uh, a COVID story because it was also a trend that was evident in 2019. It's, it's, it's not just a, um, a really state story. Probably concentration or capital consolidation is less of a story in private equity markets than it is in other asset classes. We'll come on to infrastructure relatively soon where this story is, is particularly evident. When we look at transaction activity, it's clear that deal activity has been hit across the board. So far this year, all sectors have been hit with the exception of industrial. We've actually seen a slight increase in the number of uh, industrial transactions during Q1 compared to Q1 of last year. And I think this is really consistent with, um, with the kind of really still solid demand for industrial assets. It really is the bright um, sector of the more traditional real estate asset classes or traditional real estate sectors as we would view them. Within retail, it's a part of the market that's been hit very, very hard, but there was also a decline in pricing prior to the pandemic there, as there were already structural issues with the um, acceleration of e-commerce um, trends. Many managers have tried to alleviate some of these pressures by moving to more experiential retail. And I think that kind of stemmed the flow of a COVID-19 pandemic, really just accelerated trends that were already in place and had been in place for quite an extended period of time. Within retail assets particularly, it remains to be seen how these are going to transact in future as we start to see more tenants move to turnover base rents. And it would be interesting again to kind of hear any perspectives about how these types of transactions can get through the underwriting process when deals are previously underwritten with traditional rent collection methods in place rather than turnover base rents. Within certain markets, we're also seeing some interesting sale and leaseback transactions, particularly in Japan, which is a very, very big change in that market. But in reality, investors are moving up the quality curve. They're focusing on the top quality assets with long-term leases, um, a preference for newer buildings or those with solid long-term um, covenants. And we don't see that changing anytime soon. Turning now to private debt markets, it's really a story of two regions. Um, the, the private debt market is really kind of dominated by the US and Europe. And these markets completely dominate the asset class. Within private debt markets, dry powder has accumulated as fundraising has continued at a pace driven by the need for yield, which hasn't been satisfied by traditional fixed income markets really anywhere around the world. Record levels of dry powder mean there'll be fierce competition for the best deals and anecdotal evidence from our clients suggests that some have walked away from deals relatively quickly due to pricing. But this hasn't reduced activity overall as quarterly deal values have increased to levels back above the long-term average. Investors are well aware that yield isn't the only driver of returns or losses within traditional fixed income markets, with recent losses drawing some comment on longer dated bonds particularly. This part of the market could be at risk in the short term, driving investors towards private debt markets. And to highlight one example particularly stands out. So when we look at Austria, which is one of the strongest sovereigns in the world, it has a 100-year bond, which has now lost around 40% of its value since its peak in mid-December of last year. And this has only been due to yields increasing from around 76 basis points to 113 basis points over the period. It really does highlight the scale of, of, the, of the potential threat to particularly in longer dated part of the, of the traditional fixed income market. So when we look at private debt markets, fundraising has been concentrated among the largest managers and the largest funds, with concentration actually increasing again last year. Thus far in 2021, the top 10 funds are dominating the market, but it's still very, very early days as more funds close throughout the year, this is likely to reduce. What I would say that over the last few years, we've seen a significant increase in the average size of the funds closing, up from around $599 million in 2018, up to close to $900 million so far this year. And when we actually look at Q1, the average fund size that's closed, according to the most um, up-to-date frequent data, it's actually around $1.2 billion, which is a record average fund size. So overall, 
2020 was a tough year for some, but there are pockets of real resilience and strength, and, and strength particularly within certain private debt strategies. Having a closer look at actual fundraising itself on a quarterly basis, we can see a very, very strong end to Q4 of last year, but a bit of a weaker start so far in 2021. The question there is, is this inflation fears making some investors question their private debt allocations? It's certainly the, the um, comments that we're hearing from many of our investor clients that that is the case. It could also be a spillover of the effect of a solid Q4 last year. But as I say, our investor clients are telling us they're a bit more nervous about inflation now. So I may commit to fewer funds and focus on those larger funds and managers, which might be best placed to benefit from really from a solid origination and transaction execution capabilities. In a market as competitive as this, you want to go to where the activity is going to be focused and where capital can be deployed without overpaying. So we often like to ask our question, uh, the same question to both managers and investors within our surveys, and they don't always give us exactly the same answers as we can see here. From a look at the chart here, managers are clearly more concerned about competition for deals and the exit environment, exactly what you'd hope, to be completely honest, while investors are more concerned about asset valuations, politics, and regulation. So it doesn't necessarily point to um, a sharp differentiation in exactly what these are concerned about. Really, I suppose this is quite consistent with the managers at the coalface actually kind of executing on transactions. That's something that they are always going to be um, very, very concerned about, particularly in a market with as much capital sloshing around as in the private debt market at the moment. When all of the above is taken together, it's leading to a real mix in the types of funds that investors are seeking in the future with demand right across the risk spectrum. But what's particularly interesting um, as of the Q1 2021 is that mezzanine special situations funds stand out so far this year with direct lending funds, which are the largest part of the market as measured by frequent, less in demand. Excuse me. So turning now to uh, infrastructure, Within infrastructure markets, funds are diversifying across their strategies, allowing investors to actually kind of find diversification sideways within infrastructure rather than through other asset classes. A decade ago, core and core plus funds together accounted for 69% of AUM in unlisted infrastructure, with debt and value added at 21%. If you fast forward towards the back end of 2020, those numbers are now at 52% and 40% of AUM respectively. Show, really does show the evolution of the infrastructure market over the last few years. When we look at fundraising, there's been real stops and starts, which do to seem to characterise, particularly last year. Confidence has been ebbing and flowing on new funds, and funds were clambering over the finish line. Q2 and Q4 were among the busiest last few years, but we shouldn't read too much into this. 2020 can still claim it. $98 billion raised by 125 funds. So it was down on 2019 to 116 billion raised by 136 funds. What we do tend to see in infrastructure is a concentration among the very, very biggest managers, and we'll come to some data on this in the next slide. So when we look at capital consolidation or concentration, uh, infrastructure is by far the most concentrated asset class in terms of fundraising when measured by the share of capital raised by the top 10 largest funds. Natural resources in second place and private debts in third place. 2020 saw a slight drop back in concentration. However, as those outside the top 10 accounted for a slightly larger share. But when we look at infrastructure capital raised over the last 10 years, 54% of that raised by the top 10 fundraisers was secured by just the top three. And the three dominant managers there are um, GIP, Brookfield and Macquarie, which continue to secure significant amounts of capital for their large scale funds. When looking at the implications of the age of the infrastructure mega fund, we can point towards deal sizes increasing, while there may also be a focus on routes to market outside the conventional fund structures for larger or more experienced LPs. We're certainly hearing among our clients that they're much more enthused about the US infrastructure market now, particularly given the likelihood of, uh, of an infrastructure bill being passed. Exactly what this will look like and which sectors will be targeted still remains to be seen, but there's a real desire to get involved with um, some greenfield uh, um, investments, particularly in the renewable energy space. 
And private market operators here seem really well placed to be able to capture any upside in delivering that infrastructure over the next few years. So while it's clear infrastructure is the most concentrated asset class for fundraising, what we can kind of see here is that 26% of those funds in market are actually chasing 73% of capital. So it's a real significant amount of capital being, being sought by those in market. This is data as of last month. So looking at this, it's unlikely that we'll see a big shift in the concentration within infrastructure investments. Turning now to, uh, to some of the sectors where infrastructure capital is being deployed, what we've seen in recent months, uh, and actually in recent years, is um, a real increase in demand for telecoms and digital infrastructure assets around the world. So within digital infrastructure, we would include data centers, fiber assets, and towers. So this is a, a continuation of the thing where managers and investors are really keen to position themselves on the right side of the work from home revolution that we've been seeing over the last 12 to 18 months. It certainly feels like this is something that's not going to go away, regardless of how much some, particularly maybe some investment banking bosses, are really keen for it not to happen. Within the digital infrastructure space, we've seen the likes of Digital Colony, EQT, Brookfield and Macquarie, all being very, very active, particularly when it comes to, to towers and data centres. Recently, we've seen KKR launch a new European data centre platform from scratch. We've seen GIC, the big sovereign wealth fund, partnering with Equinix. In Quadrille, the Canadian Pension Fund partnering with T5 data centers, to name just a few examples. These have been global transactions as well with activity across the US, Europe, some activity in Asia, also um, Africa and South America. So these are kind of long term growth markets and long term growth stories. It's something that we're particularly positive about. And if, if you're a premium subscriber, you can have a look on our, insets, uh, in, in, on our Insights Plus platform where we um, have done some sector deep dives recently on the uh, telecom towers part of the market and data centers. So now when we look at investor views on potential returns, this suggests that the market is cooled somewhat in 2020, but perhaps leaving some potential upside. So while positive, this may prove to be a temporary blip as interest in the infrastructure sector continues to grow. Those already investing in the sector appear very, very happy with their investments and are generally expecting to allocate significant amounts of capital to the asset class in future. However, managers will be cognizant of the fact that assets previously deemed relatively low risk, such as toll roads and airports, have likely moved up the risk curve in the wake of the pandemic. Some sectors do stand out, however, and we really do feel that the digital infrastructure theme is something that's not going to go away anytime soon. So that concludes a broader asset class overview where we are at the moment. Lots and lots of positive themes emerging from the pandemic. And we kind of hope that we've really highlighted the resilience of private capital and alternative markets overall. It's certainly a very difficult year throughout 2020 for some operators within the market, but it's been one of real strength as well. And I think the alternative managers have really kind of proven their worth in recent, in recent months. If we look at ESG now, this is a top level insight into the share of AUM, which are under ESG commitment. So it's clear here that Europe and Australasia really lead the pack, but ESG commitments are somewhat binary and opaque. So ESG has been, with, within Prepin, we've been deepening our monitoring on fund managers, the ESG efforts, and I've started to look at the individual documents that support ESG claims. From this work, we've developed an ESG transparency score based on the number of documents available and the number of transparency measures. So what's interesting here, is that where our analysis, our analysis of North America particularly suggests that the region's third by ESG commitments by their transparency score, they're actually fourth. So it's clearly one thing to commit, but another to communicate this effectively to the market by transparent publication of policies and supporting documentation. This is maybe something where North American firms still need to improve. We're planning to continue our deepening and broadening of our ESG insight, and we're constantly applying our transparency scores across our wider research Particular look, particularly looking at the relationship with the diversity of investors that fund managers were able to attract. And this is part of some network analysis that we're hoping to put together for later this year. We do see that there's a strong correlation between the transparency score and the number of different investor types that fund managers secure. While there's a common driver here, it's the size of the GP, promoting both ESG transparency and investor diversity, ESG remains a valuable source of differentiation 
from competitors for smaller GPs particularly. This view on the relations between performance and ASG has changed in the last few years, and we've reflected on why that might be. My own personal viewers think a lot is about values outside of future cash flows, and as much of a perception of assets exposures to future uncertain regulatory risk than increasingly favourable commercials at the asset stands. Downside management rather than upside pursuit, you could say. The interest here is coming from established conventional energy companies, shells and BPs, etc., in renewable assets is pushing up entry prices. Recent auctions of plots, say for example in the North Sea in the UK, attest to this with less well-known renewable developers being pushed to the sidelines. As for growth in interest, it's clear with the figure on the right that these numbers are quite different, even just one year back, as you might imagine. With over a third of investors saying they've turned down opportunities due to concerns over ESG, and another 43% saying they would, it's clear that what has been a nice to have so far in the past is now a minimum requirement for investors around the world. Private equity and real estate are ahead in terms of investor ESG policies with infrastructure third. Each asset class has potential to better clarify its angle on ESG, as, as a lot of adoption so far is relatively generic. We expect those managers that are better able to clearly evidence and communicate their ESG expertise to benefit as a key source of differentiation. So that concludes my presentation for today. I appreciate you taking the time to listen in. We've obviously gone through a, a, quite a lot of data and information over the past 35, 37 minutes or so. We do have plenty of time left for questions and answers. So if there's anything specific that you feel you'd like to, to ask, please do shout. Just having a look at um, some of the questions that have come, come through so far. Uh, to, to reiterate, the slides will be available. Um, we'll be making these available either via a flyer or by a landing page on the Prequin website. So thanks for, uh, for asking. So we've had a, chair, a, a question coming from um, Johan Cordoba uh, regarding the impact of inflation or concern of inflation on natural resources. And I think actually you're probably right on this, on this point, to be completely honest with you, in that our, our AUM forecast for natural resources are positive, but probably a little bit weak compared to other asset classes. And I think a lot of this is down to um, the returns that have been delivered from these assets. If you look at the uh, performance indices that are published by Prequin, we think that um, natural resources funds have been underperforming despite them still seeing some investor interest as a portfolio diversification tool. This could potentially change in future if uh, inflation does become embedded. We're going to talk, we're hearing a lot more talk these days about a new resources super cycle. So let's kind of see how that progresses. You could actually see an increase in natural resources assets, at least in the short term. So I hope, I hope that's answered that question. I'm not sure if I have any more questions from anybody at this stage. So Dave, what's the um, story on large asset management firms receiving most of the money raised last year versus small? Where, where does the, you know, where does it like turn out? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's a very good question. And when we speak to our clients, we're kind of hearing a few stories about how this might change in the future. So over the past year or so, when uh, global travel was kind of knocked on its head to a certain extent, we were really kind of seeing that um, investors were favoring those managers where they had long-term existing relationships. I think if you're investing in a fund with a big manager, um, you, the communication levels were probably stepped up. They were very, very clear and open about what they were doing to aid their portfolio companies through a real time of stress. And I think that cemented those relationships. Whereas for emerging or new managers, um, it's a difficult market to go and prove yourself in, um, particularly when many investors were kind of thinking, right, let's just kind of play it relatively safely. Um, I'm almost going to stick to the knitting to a certain extent. And I think that's really kind of aided managers over the last year or so. But what we're hearing just anecdotally from some of our investor clients is that um, they probably allocated enough to some of these big managers to a certain extent. So they're more willing to consider emerging or first time managers particularly those um, who are real specialists and can operate in the part of the market, but some of the bigger managers might not be as nimble. And I think you could probably include that digital infrastructure space as part of that as well, but there are definitely some things within other asset classes 
or within certain strategies uh, within our classes as well. So although that's been a trend in the past, um, I'm kind of really hoping that we can start to see some of these emerging or first time managers benefit from the uh, opening up of markets as we go throughout 2021 into 2022. Have there been any, um, any niches, any types of strategies that um, received more inflows last year um, outside of those pre-existing relationships? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's interesting to see in, in the venture capital space, if you are a, a manager or an emerging manager with really good quality relationships, and I mean, by that I mean key relationships with firms who are, are developing products or services that are potentially going to be on the right side of this digital evolution and the kind of continuing trend, uh, trend and change within, within the kind of work from home market. We've seen managers kind of focused on that part of the market still, still doing very, very well. Um, it's, it's still not an easy market to kind of operate in and you've really got to um, prove how you can differentiate because in this type of market as well where competition for assets is quite fierce, transaction origination and execution becomes even more important. So if you're unable to highlight your skills within, within those very kind of um, clear skill sets, you're going to struggle to, to attract capital if, uh, if an investor doesn't think you're going to be able to deploy it or if they think you're going to be too aggressive in deploying that and overpaying for an asset. So I think that's where, where a lot of these emerging managers have got to be very, very careful. But having said that, it's up to them to go and prove their, their skills to investors as well. If they, if, if they can talk a good story, um, maybe kind of bring in some solid experience from elsewhere, and I think that will really tell over time. So is liquid and illiquid also one of these concerns? Is it public uh, securities, like in the hedge funds versus private real estate deals, or have you seen capital going into, you know, I, I, I guess that what I'm trying to get at is traditionally multifamily um, real estate, commercial real estate has been the easiest to use some of the new tools um, that an investor could use to do due diligence on um, a new relationship right? Because at the end of the day, you know, it's backed by real estate, right? So yeah. are some strategies uh, attracting more money as a result of the safety, even if they're illiquid of the asset class, or is it the types of structures like SPACs and ETFs and stuff with, you know, with like really short liquidity profiles that are attracting the money? Got you. I think to answer that question, and I can kind of draw on some of the conversations that we've had. And I think if you look at um, more broader portfolios, there is still a bit of concern that public equity markets are still pretty, pretty uh, frothy and still pretty highly valued, to be completely honest with you, despite some of the corrections that we've had in some parts of the market. And I think based upon that, and there's still relatively weak returns that we're getting from, from the more traditional fixed income investments, it's still really pushing investors towards that um, alternative assets overall. And I think within that, investors are also looking at how they can protect against inflation in the future as well. So that is driving demand for, for real estate assets in the short term. Um, and that's, I think, despite some of the challenges that real estate faces. Yes, you're backed by some kind of real hard, tangible assets. But if you're buying a 15 to 20 year old office with a short lease, you're exposing yourself to some quite significant obsolescence risk in doing that. Um, I think investors are probably more um, keen to take, to, to take part with the asset repositioning for offices for, for um, refurbishment there as well. I think that's quite interesting. When it comes to, to multifamily as well, exactly where those assets are located is, is also something that's increasingly concerning um, investors because we're hearing stories anecdotally and they're starting to see some evidence of people moving away from the city centres, maybe becoming a bit more um, willing and able to take a longer commute on the chin if they're only going into the office two to three days a week. So exactly what that might mean for built to rent type assets within the city centres, I think that's going to be interesting to see how that market plays out. So for real estate particularly, um, it's still, there's still lots of uncertainty around there. And I think that's also kind of pushing investors towards infrastructure as well, because you can have security of cash flows. If you're buying an asset that's got, say for example, a long-term PPA, so you know exactly what your income is going to be, it's a bit of an inflation hedge, You've got security of cash flows in the future as well. I think that's what's driving 
a lot of activity in that part of the market too. And investors are willing to take the illiquidity premium on the chin. That's certainly what we're seeing anyway. And there's a real um, feeling that investors generally within alternatives are sticking with the programme there. They've enjoyed the returns that they've got from these types of assets in the past. They think they're going to continue in the future. We might not have had the wholesale repricing across all asset classes that we had post the GFC, but I think that also provides some relative stability as well. So you have a question that came in um, from Johan, and he's basically saying, I, I worry that the largest concern or challenge seen by GPs are the increased competition for assets. I think most of today's valuations have been driven by too much money chasing few assets. I think GPs need to work harder to differentiate themselves. It's tough to get good quality assets at the, the right price. I guess it's not so much a question as, as a statement, but maybe uh, you want to elaborate on, on that. Yeah, to be honest, I think, I think it's a fair point. And um, we've certainly seen that within private debt markets, as I was alluding to in the presentation, with some of the, man some of the managers that we speak to walking away from deals pretty quickly because they are just um, looking too expensive. But I think you could say that of uh, almost every single asset class. I think it's probably true of public equities. It's probably true of um, alternatives to a certain extent. But you've got to look at where the growth is and how that growth is being put together and how value is being added across an investment over the life of that investment. And I think that's where alternative markets can kind of still really stand out, deliver solid returns. They can get very, very close to their portfolio companies. They can have a real influence on their success. And I think that's something that um, alternative managers are able to do. So it's not just about your entry point. It's kind of how do you factor that into your underwriting and what's your exit point for an investment as well, because that's where the value is created on exit rather than on, um, solely on entry. Um, so I think it's, it, 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 it's an, an interesting point. But there's still plenty of growth left on the table at the moment. If we look at the recovery from, from COVID, yes, it's not without its issues. There are some imbalances still to be worked through on government debt. Remains to be seen what might be done to kind of plug some of these kind of fiscal gaps as well with, with, with governments around the world. But overall, I think if you'd have said we'd be at this point at the end of Q1 2021, um, if you'd have said that at the end of Q1 2020, we, we would have um, snapped your hand off and been really pleased with where we are now. And I think we've just got to recognise that we've worked through a particularly unique position and a unique set of circumstances in the last year. And I think many managers, investors and asset classes have emerged much stronger for that. So, Dave, what about the, the difference between, because you, you covered a lot of territory today, right? You're talking yes. about real estate, you're talking about venture. Um, like, I don't know. I, I feel like investors are constantly looking for, um, you know, ways to make money without having any, any risk whatsoever. And these, these different types of investment opportunities pop up like venture debt, right? Where mm -hmm. you take growth and then all of a sudden you're lending it money, which historically speaking, wasn't, a possibility, right? It wasn't like something that was normally practiced. Um, I suppose that venture debt is popular right now. It is, and I think increasingly popular as well, to be honest with you, because exactly as you say, um, investors are just looking for different parts of the market where they can go and earn a decent return on their capital for, for, for a, a whatever unit of risk. And I think they're kind of looking at... Um, as, as you say, venture debt's increasingly of interest. There are also um, real estate debt, infrastructure debt for, for that part of the market, particularly because if you look at allocations to, to fixed income, it's, it's, it's probably been a, been, been, a, been a real struggle, particularly if you have got some kind of look, longer duration within that part of your portfolio. You're facing a few threats, um, I think. Um, and the, the uh, Austrian 100 year bond was, I think, kind of part of that, and partly reflecting just how much. The small movement in yield can have an impact on the uh, capital value there. So I think that's something that investors are aware of. They're going to the managers who were able to kind of talk them through those risks and look at how they deploy their capital over time. And so they can really understand the managers and what they're investing in. I think that's been really key to, for investors over the last few years. And I can't really see any long-term change to that. 
So tell, tell us what a venture debt deal looks like today. What types of underlying assets, like, you know, these managers are investing into what types of transactions? To be honest with you, it's probably not a part of the market I'm closest to, but my understanding is that there is often a focus on later stage um, companies and where you're better able to mount to, to kind of measure the risks and the upside to, to that potential investment. Um, but other than that, I need to kind of delve into the data a little bit more to uh, give you a more accurate answer on that, to be frank. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, today's discussion is not necessarily about um, venture debt or not about venture debt. It's just, I think a lot of people are not even aware that it exists, venture debt, right? Mm. I think that people are still learning about it, um, you know, unless you're actually focused on it. So I, I find it, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I was going to say it's part of the market where we're frequently looking to continually expand our data set. So it's something that uh, is on our roadmap to try and provide some more um, granular data within that as well. So all, all I would say is going to keep watching this space um, and um, we're, we're going to see exactly what we can do over the next six to 12 months on that front. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to kind of provide a bit more of, a, of an accurate reflection of that part of the market. There are a few things that we're looking at. So for example, we're looking at increasing our um, coverage of SPAC markets through some, kind of, um, through some data there as well, because um, but there is a feeling that investors are asking us questions about it. So we need to be in a position to be able to answer those questions with a bit of authority. Yeah, absolutely. And with regards to returns of venture debt, what is what do the return profiles look like in the space? To be honest with you, I'm really not entirely sure. So I'd have to go and have a look at the performance data that we have on the funds operating in that part of the market. But leave it with me and I'll get something back to you. Yeah, absolutely. We, we always love to have Prequent involved and you guys are going to be, um, you know, participating in the series with us for the next year, uh, which, you know, we're really excited um, about. Today's presentation is available for those of you that have been asking for uh, the slides from Dave. If you have any questions, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, you can dump those questions into the um, into the Q&A chat and we have some questions in there now, perhaps, Dave, you want to answer some of those questions? Yeah, so we have a question from Pal Sarai here saying investors haven't adjusted, adjusted their expectations despite living in lots of negative interest rates for the last 10 years. And I think that's probably a fair assessment to be completely honest with you. And that's why we're kind of seeing this tilt towards alternatives, because if you're still expecting to get certain um, returns from a part of your investment portfolio that's just not able to, to deliver those, Often we're kind of saying that alternatives can. And I think that's one of the key things that's driving allocations towards alternatives. Um, there was an interesting stat put out by Brookfield towards the back end of last year, and I bought my team, Mike, and they're talking about this quite frequently. And they were saying that um, they expect or they could potentially see allocations to alternatives increasing from the kind of 20 to 25% that they're at now up to 60% by 2030. And I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that number, but it just kind of does highlight the scale of, of the attractiveness of alternatives in general, particularly compared to other asset classes. So I think, yes, investors can't always adjust their return expectations, but let's kind of see exactly uh, what they do in terms of their alternatives allocations to go and hit their targets. We have another question from um, Paul Sarai again. So do you think they have GPs, what they want to hear? The reality is anyone promising 800 to 1400 bits above 10 year treasuries, range of returns promised from private market managers and different strategies is taking tremendous risks and offering competitively on the grasp of most institutional investors. Um, I would say yes and no. I, I think it's up to a manager to go and explain exactly what risks they're taking to go and drive some of these returns. Um, if you look at what um, some of the bigger managers are doing, working with their portfolio companies on capital restructurings and you're looking at um, some potential. Um, convertible debt within that as well. I think that's a, an interesting part of the market. So there's still often up, upside from there. Um, you, you do kind of see some investors moving up the risk curve and they kind of come back to the point about return requirements. If, you, if your return requirements aren't shifting, how much additional risk are you willing to take to hit those return targets? And I think that's kind of partially covered by what managers can offer at various parts of the market. And we also had a question here from Grant Calder. We're seeing a preference of closed-ended versus open-ended private debt funds. Um, good question, Grant. Um, frequent data focuses primarily 
on the close end of the market, but we are increasing our data collection efforts on the open ended part of the market too. Um, I would say right now, closed ended remains our, our focus. So that's kind of part of the market that we can, can probably kind of talk to um, with most authority. That's where the bulk of our data is. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to see demand for open and new funds, not just in private debt, but across other asset classes as well. There are obviously going to be some risks um, around that as well in terms of how you educate your investors, whether there are certain kind of length of lock-ins as part of that, they still remain open. Um, so it's part of the market that we're expecting to see further growth and some innovation on the open and new part of the market um, in the next few years. But we are, we are increasing our data collection efforts on that front too. So I hope that answers your question. So, Dave, is there anything interesting uh, coming up that Prequin has that people should be on the lookout for? Anything that you think that uh, the audience today would benefit from uh, with regards to what you and the Prequin team have been working on? Yeah, to be honest with you, we have a lot of um, global coverage coming through across asset classes at the moment. We released a, a report on the uh, Australian private capital industry um, overnight, um, which has been pretty well received so far. We have a, an APAC report coming up soon. It's the first of our regional APAC reports. Um, so it's relatively new for us, looking at what's driving LP commitments towards APAC and looking at some of the reasons behind that. We have a, a US real estate report coming out next month. So do keep an eye out for that. And then we're actually going to be publishing our first America's focused report, looking at the bulk of the private capital asset, asset classes, including hedge funds. So we'll be releasing that um, during the summer. Um, within that, we'll be looking at Canada. Um, we'll have a, a, a bit of a section covering uh, Canadian markets, a bit more of a focus on the US, and also leverage work that we did earlier in the year, looking at South America. Um, we'll have a bit of an update to our content there as well. Um, and that's in addition to our usual uh, output across private capital compensation review, which I'm sure many people will always going to look out for with interest, just so they can get a benchmark their own pay and benefits. Um, it's something that I know is um, very, very popular among participants. And also something on, on fund terms, we pushed back the, the launch of that report so we can capture a bit more data. So we'll look at um, fees and exactly how that um, looks across um, asset classes um, within the private capital industry. So there's a, there's a lot that's coming up. We've had a pretty, very, very busy year so far this year, and there's no sign of it slowing down so far. So now with regards to Prequin, um, in closing, um, what, are, what are your plans to to do conferences, not do conferences in person? Are you, uh, what, what's the plan? To be honest, we're, we're really hopeful that there will be some in-person conferences in the future. Um, I think I, I kind of, well, I can't put words in other people's mouths, but I've really missed the kind of human interaction and just standing on a platform and then realistically miss going for a few beers afterwards and just kind of chewing the fat. I think that's where you find out some, some really interesting stuff. I think everybody's really looking forward to meeting people again in person, actually kind of seeing them. It's, it's one of those kind of things where we've had so much interaction over Zoom, you almost kind of forget what people kind of tend to look like in reality. So it's going to be really good to kind of get back on the road and kind of do some of these in-person meetings. Really looking forward to it personally. So I think the plan is frequent to participate in in-person events wherever we can. Do you have I'm anything? encouraging my team to do it. Anything planned for the States? Um, not that I'm aware of in person just yet, but... Um, we're open to any invitations as and when they come through. If we have anything that happens in person, then um, I would say get in touch with us and we'll, we will we uh, will look to see where we can participate. Absolutely. Well, hopefully we can have you here in the fourth quarter. Uh, we plan to go back to uh, in-person events at the end of the year uh, in a modified form than what we were doing historically, but we would love to have you in person. So per perhaps the, the fourth quarter. I will keep my fingers crossed. We'll have to grab one of those beers together. You're right. I very much look forward to that. All right, Dave. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure.